at the previous part of our lecture, we were discussing the cultivation effect of uh, the television on the audience. But maybe audience within the media effects can be seen a little bit different. Maybe we do carry on some sort of critical thinking and we can choose the information which we like. This is what we're going to discuss right now. And this is the theory of the selection, selective exposure, which refers to the way how we can reduce cognitive dissonance. But let's clear up first. So what is cognitive dissonance? Uh, let's think of the example. There is a test in the class and you're a student and you're definitely not ready. So you uh, decided to go out the night before and now you're not prepared at all. You know and you agree that cheating is bad and looking at someone else's uh, test results, it's not a very good idea. But still you find yourself cheating. Now you're experiencing two confronting cognitive which Leon Festinger, the author of the theory of cognitive dissonance, suggests leads to the way as we know as cognitive dissonance, basically. What can you do in this situation to make yourself feel better and comfortable? Let's take a look at the cognitive dissonance theory uh, to outline the possible reactions here. But first, we need to think of what the cognitive dissonance is all about. Well, the basic assumptions of the theory are that, first of all, uh, individuals do hold multiple cognitions about the world and ourselves they seek for these cognitions to be consistent so they would be in a good relationship with each other and they will be supporting each other. Cognition stands for basically a thought so you don't want to have two confronting thoughts in your head. Experience of the dissonance when the two thoughts are confronted forces us to reduce or eliminate it or to somehow achieve the balance within these cognitions. So in this case, we can speak about different directions in which we can uh, move. So some behavioral outcomes which are ending up uh, with, the, with this uh, cognitive dissonance uh, appearance in the very first place. The individuals are motivated to select the messages that would match their own beliefs. So you would want to avoid this cognitive dissonance. Let's take a look at the classic example, which was the very initial beginning for the cognitive dissonance concept emergence. It was conducted in 1959 by Leo Festinger and his team as three groups of students who were invited to conduct one extremely boring task. And these three groups of students, in total it was about 71 students, uh, had to react and respond to this task quite differently. The first, the control group, they were just conducting the task. And they then they were left alone. The second group was paid one dollar to conduct this task. Uh, why one dollar was still quite little money even for 1959. Uh, and after conducting this task, they were asked to tell the following students to say that the task was really interesting. The next group, the third one, was paid twenty dollars to do the same thing. So they were doing the boring stuff, and after that, they would say that the task was interesting for those who would come back to continue with the activity. So, what was the results of the experiment after? everybody went through this task, uh, students were asked to estimate how interesting was it and to rank it. So uh, the uh, findings uh, show us that the students who were paid $20 and the students from the control group who were not paid money, but they were not asked to lie at the same time, they would say that task was dull. Right? But the group which was paid one dollar would rate it a little bit high and saying it was not that bad. So here Leon Festinger decided that there must be some kind of stimuli which would uh, influence the difference with these two responses to the same, the completely the same stuff. And it was called cognitive dissonance. What's the explanation here? The group which was paid one dollar were the one who was suffering from this cognitive dissonance as they had to lie, which they didn't like, but they lied for very little money. To other groups, they had justification. The first, the control group, they were just participating in the experiment and they did not have to lie, so they just did it. So they were completely honest with each other and with others. As the, the other group who got paid $20, they did it for money. So basically lying for money is quite okay. And this uh, emergence uh, of uh, two confronting cognitions was the cause which influenced the group who got paid $1 to estimate this uh, task a little bit higher. 
So let's summarize what are the possible uh, relationships between the cognition. The first one is consonant cognition. It's when everything is okay and there is no cognitive dissonance at all. Irrelevant relationships, it's when these two cognitions are not really in the relationship with each other, so it does not bother us. And the dissonant relationship, which caused that problem after all, is when our two cognitions or actions uh, are inconsistent with each other and we would try to find the ways to eliminate it. When we talk about our general understanding of some particular issue, we can speak about the ratio of cognition. So this is the proportion of dissonant or uh, dissonant to consonant elements. And if uh, some of them is increasing, we will try to eliminate it. The, there are a few ways uh, in which we can respond. So usually it would end up with either behavioral change, so we will change the action, which is inconsistent with the way we are thinking, or we will change the attitude. So we'll be like, mm, no, I, I don't really like cheating. Let's go back to our very first example and see uh, what are the possible reactions on this cheating situation. Well, the first one is to revoke the decision. I will never do this again and you just go cheating so you have an explanation that was the one a very exceptional case you don't plan to do this once again so you know we all have the right for the mistake the second one is to increase the attractiveness of the chosen alternative if i won't do it i will never graduate this year so you kind of put yourself in the situation there is no other option the third option is to decrease the attractiveness of the unchosen option. So the unchosen option here, in this case, not to cheat. So everybody cheats. Why wouldn't I be the one who doesn't? What makes me quite different from the other people? Uh, the next one is to reduce the importance of the decision. This test was worth only 10% of the final grade, so it's, it's not important whatsoever. I can cheat and it's not the major, uh, the major problem of my life or it's not going to be somehow paying to me off uh, in the future. So here uh, we can see uh, the change of the attitude. We can also change our behavior. So our initial intention was to cheat. And we found ourselves thinking that cheating is really bad. So we can just change the behavior and not to cheat and to just change uh, to get the grade which we actually deserve. Okay, here is the cheating situation, but how does it work in terms of the media effect? This theory has stimulated a great deal of the discussion and its implications uh, were used for quite a variety of uh, the situation. And here we speak about selective retention, uh, which is according to the definition is the human tendency to remember messages that are consistent with our existing attitudes and beliefs. So we tend to remember all the good stuff which happened to us. And me personally, I always forget about all the bad stuff which happened. So it wouldn't bother me and my perception of myself. Uh, so the theory makes uh, the predictions about whether people will seek uh, information and what kind of information they will seek for. It makes a prediction about human thought and behavior after making a decision. So this would be uh, referred to the post-decisional dissonance as well. So after, for example, uh, the case when we uh, get, we purchase something and uh, after a while, uh, some sort of alternatives appeared on the market. We would suffer. That why we wouldn't wait for a little while? Why we wouldn't get this option instead of the first one? So this post-decisional dissonance is also something which may occur. Uh, the implications of the cognitive dissonance theory for persuasion as well as the specific form of the persuasion, uh, they, they called uh, into the theoretical background. So uh, the cognitive dissonance theory is very inf influential in terms of the media effects. Let's now focus uh, what is called the selective exposure. And uh, this is the part of uh, the theory uh, which is directly referring to cognitive dissonance as well as to the media effects. So media has the selective effect on people, but 
it happens just because the audience is really active and people would tend to consume the information which will somehow correspond with the existing beliefs and the attitudes. The studies uh, within the selective exposure theory focus on factors that lead to the selective exposure or to that uh, the, the factors that mediate the process, uh, whereas other studies deal with the consequences of the selective exposure to information processing. Uh, how we can speak about examples here. So the first, what are the causes which will uh, force me to pick this but not the different information? And the second type of uh, the selective exposure effect is how uh, the public agenda and how our decisions and uh, how our thoughts about what's going on within the society vary due to the differences in media consumption patterns. How do we research uh, the sphere of uh, the selective exposure? Well, first of all, we ask respondents to do some self-report. So what is the type of media you consume? What are your existing thoughts? And how do you, uh, how do you approach the reality? Uh, when it comes to the political behavior, selective exposure must be quite influential theory and might, must be quite influential theoretical framework to explain why certain people uh, choose uh, certain types of media and avoid others. Well, they do it just to avoid cognitive dissonance, but uh, now we can provide a clear understanding and clear explanation for um, for distinguishing these different types of people and distinguishing these different groups who would focus on different patterns of media consumption. Laboratory experiments are quite widespread as well. So you, uh, it happens when you get some people together and you ask them to mark down uh, what are their ideas, uh, for example, about uh, the presidential elections and uh, about uh, one and the second particular candidates who are fighting there in order to get the, uh, the chair. Uh, after that, you would provide uh, uh, your respondents, uh, the people who are participating in this experiment, with some materials who would have some sort of information, which will be either negative or positive to one or the other candidate. And after people consumed this information, you just ask them to do the same routine over again and to see whether the attitude have changed or it didn't. Well, guess what might happen? People with the certain ideas would just avoid the information which is not favorable to the thoughts and to the cognitions they carrying already. So this is one of the ways how we can prove the selective exposure effects in like real life situation. Observations uh, is another way. Uh, you can observe yourself, you can observe other people and talk to them about uh, what, is, uh, what is their media consumption practices and what are their tastes and what are their attitudes. Selective and forced exposure to the media content uh, as you can track how people or individuals uh, get through the information. Are they really being selected? Are they avoiding some parts and some materials or not? And the forced exposure when you again face the person with the confronting ideas and see uh, how does it happen. Maybe there, there is going to be some sort of behavioral change and person will just run away from this experiment. Or maybe it will end up uh, in the changing attitude, so the person will change their attitude towards what's happening. Well, as we have seen within this part of the course, audience has been taking more and more active role when it comes to the media effect. Still, it is very important to consider the means of communication and the medium particularly when we think about spreading the information and transmitting it from people or from some uh, particular uh, sources to the broader audience. Uh, now let's think and speak a little bit more uh, about the role of uh, the audience and its attitudes in the next section.